Aisha entered the library to see a particular strange sight, but every strange sight is a particular strange sight. But this was the sight of Mildred fighting two short pirates, they armed with swords and her with a stretchy neck desk lamp, which wasn't functioning very well as a weapon. As she looked around, the whole library seemed to have gone a bit odd. People were hiding under reading tables but still reading their books. The reference department was actually doing something, being cowards, and some patrons had locked themselves in closed off rooms. Also, there was a large group of teenagers there who were taking pictures with their phones and sending them off to friends to make memes from. That last part wasn't odd at all, though. Most people living in Clearcut are used to Mildred handling these types of situations, because stuff like this happens at CCHS all the time, and from time to time in the surrounding areas. You just never know in Clearcut. When you walk out your front door and encounter a group of long-headed macrocephali, lost and in need of directions, or on your way for late-night fast food to see a giant Mayora perched on top of a bus stop, waiting for time to cycle back. Aisha has never gotten used to these things because she isn't a bystander, and is always in the thick of it all, her being the sidekick. Getting into the thick of it again, she ran and jumped on the back of one of the pirates and put her hands over his eyes so he couldn't see. It's a good fighting method, and almost always worked out best for women in 1980s American detective shows. These jocks may have turned into pirates. But just like the cheerleaders and the other football players, they are also zombified and not so bright. Pretty clueless. Single-minded, if you will. This individual zombified former football player, now zombie pirate, started charging wildly around the library with Aisha on his back. He ran into desks. He ran into displays. Chairs were upended. Walls were potholed. Complaining taxpayers hip-checked and doors knocked open. I'm on a Pirates of the Caribbean pinball game, Aisha yelled to everyone and no one at once. In, Mildred shouted back to her. What? asked Aisha, a little stunned they were having the conversation at that exact point of time and space. You said on. Shouldn't you have said you're in a Pirates of the Caribbean pinball game? Mildred yelled. Shut up and help me, Aisha replied. Mildred elegantly jumped up on the shoulders of the zombified football player pirate she was sparring with, then, with her feet together, jumped up on top of his head, her weight driving him face first into the floor, knocking him out. Then she raced to Aisha's spinning tour, which had moved into the YA room by this time, scattering Doctor Who displays, it's the anniversary year, tumbling off tables. Such a crime to damage such valuable items. Jump off, Mildred yelled to her friend. Aisha let go and fell more than jumped off the pirate's back. Mildred took the opportunity of a still disorientated zombified pirate junior varsity football player and tackled it into a wall, and thus, like its friend, knocked it into unconsciousness. Before she could even check on the condition of her best friend, a loud voice bellowed into the room in Brian blessed fashion. It was a voice she really doesn't care for, but recognised right off. Mildred Bet Beezer. It was Coach Kirk, the head football coach at Clearcut High, an assistant coach of just about every other sport. School sports administrator, bus driver, gym teacher and driver's ed teacher. He wore many hats, like many others, because even at a school like Clearcut High the teachers got paid shit. As he walked over to Mildred, he glanced at Aisha like someone looking at a person they have to smile at for political reasons, but could not in fact stand the sight of. And of course, your sidekick Anastasia? Aisha responded with a smart-ass face in his direction 
direction as she was seated on the floor because he always got her name wrong on purpose and she knew it. Coach Kirk? Mildred stated his name, knowing he wanted something. He was always wanting something from her and she was always shooting him down. The coach put his arm around Mildred's shoulders. If you join the football team, we'd win state undefeated every year until you graduate, Coach Kirk said. <sighs> Let me stop you before you get started. As we've discussed in the past, that would be unfair to the other teams, Mildred said, while removing his arm, putting a little too much pressure on his wrist, but he fought showing any pain. Coach Kirk gave her a disapproving side-eye before walking away. No problem. My teams are already going to stand out like no other teams ever have in high school sports. Mildred helped Aisha to her feet as they watched him leave the YA room. That man makes me uncomfortable, Mildred said. It's the whole balding glory days thing that gives off that effect, Aisha stated. Sasha's family had just finished dinner and was cleaning up from the large first night in the new house meal. Her parents loved the whole family eating together at one table, away from everything, doing the family conversation thing. Sasha, unlike most kids of her age, enjoyed having dinner together with her family. Well, sometimes it bothered her, but then just in the way when you're really young, anything seemingly out of the ordinary from others your age can bother you. In the kitchen with her father, Gus, they were doing the dishes with everyone else back in the living room watching more of a Netflix show they'd started before dinner. They don't have cable, but pick one show from Netflix and they'll watch it every night until it's finished. Then they discuss the show and vote on what to watch next. It's a little forced family fun, but they all like it, so forced or not, it's good. Except when Sasha is feeling like her age and doesn't like it because it's a family thing. So, was that one of our new neighbours you were talking to on the steps? Gus asked his daughter. That's not his real name, but it's a nice normal one from some of the things he has been called himself in the past. Her name's Aisha, she seems really nice. Sasha knew what her father was going to say next. You know to be very careful with how you talk and interact with people. I know, Dad. Have you found out anything we didn't brief you on about the neighbourhood? Gus questioned. One library, old houses, the school and that small amusement park place just as Mum said in the debriefing, Sasha replied. Any other bits of information? Only two other families with kids. Except for those families, it's almost all older citizens, Sasha said. Traffic lines? Gus asked. The only people who normally would be travelling through either would be those living here, visiting someone here, or heading to the library, Sasha said. I've been reading up on the public school. It's ranked as one of the best high schools in the country, Gus stated. Yep, and here I am, a good homeschool Jesus freak, Sasha retorted. I know your mum is talking about wanting to move you fully into public schools, but what do you think about just doing the classes this year for dual enrolment at Clearcut High, and then maybe next year full in if you like it? That's okay with me. But mum thinks I need to be around more people my age. She seems to have a big fixation on that right now, Sasha said. I think she'll be fine with the plan being us moving you there next year. But is this what you want? Gus questioned. It's all good with me, Dad. I don't see any reason this place can't be the place that we stay until the getting the old kids out of the house happens, Sasha replied. Gus smiled at his daughter. You sure? he asked her. This seems like a pretty nice place for us. I think we can all be happy here, even if we are the offspring of former supervillains. Former's the key word there, Tater, Gus said. Aisha was home alone. Her mother was, as usual for most nights, at work. So Aisha was spending time sitting down for a meal of potato sticks from the school snack store, a ham sandwich and a huge glass of soda. Which isn't so much a glass of soda, but more a movie plastic popcorn bucket full of soda. She has a little soda addiction. Adding to the joy of her course of entertainment was sitting on her bed with her food, watching a British comedy marathon on PBS and texting with Mildred, which is pretty much the regular nightly routine for her and her best friend. Mildred. What you doing? Aisha. Eating a sandwich and watching British comedies. Mildred. That's what you do almost every night for dinner. Aisha. Well, if my parent isn't here to parent and make a three-course meal, I say treat yourself. Mildred. Is your mum working overtime again? Aisha. As mum says, overtime isn't something you turn down. Mildred. And it's not like your mum cooks much. Aisha. Um, my mum is a master reheater. Mildred. She can cook though. I've witnessed it. Aisha. She only cooks when you're over. Mildred. Maybe she likes me more than you. Aisha. I think it's because you do the dishes. She's given up on getting me to do dishes, so we eat a lot of stuff that comes in throwaway plates. Mildred. And there isn't an answer in there anywhere that maybe you should offer to do the dishes more? Aisha. Shh. Watching TV. Later that same night, during the time of deep sleep, within the dream trail, which is the place of dreams, the person, the dream healer, the second of such persons, is shifting himself into a change from the normal reality into an altered state of reality that has even affected the realm he protects. All dreams of our reality are dreams, but also all shifts in reality have their own dreams. Don't worry, no one is meant to understand any of that. Mildred was deep into a dream. 
She sleeps so deep that it would take a bomb to wake her up. One time, when Aisha and her were at the movies, they ended up having to see a Nicholas Sparks movie, Aisha's mum's choice, and Mildred fell into such a deep sleep, they left her in the theatre, and she woke up the next morning as the theatre staff were turning on the lights to start the early morning showings. This dream had her walking through a forest, a forest she'd visited in her dreams almost every night since she was 13. That's the age when she first developed her powers. She was confused and scared, and in this place she found comfort, calm, and a mentor. Though in classic mentor superiority, he is enigmatic and talks in riddled ways. This time, on the trip to the forest, she is also there with Aisha, who then spots Sasha. Sasha runs from behind to catch up with them. Mildred looks to Aisha, who shrugs and changes her guarded facial expression to a smile. It's weird, I'm dreaming about you and we just met, Sasha says. Welcome to the world of being near Mildred Betbeezer, Aisha replied. Hi, I'm Mildred. Mildred and Sasha shook hands. I've heard of you, Sasha said, the superpowered beyond human high school girl who Pulpy asked to be a sidekick, but you turned him down? I'd rather graduate college before going pro, Mildred said. They talked more and walked further into the forest before coming across a man sitting in a clearing in a Queen Anne chair. Can't get more high superiority and enigmatic than sitting in the middle of a forest in a Queen Anne chair, can you? Scratch that question mark, I think that was a rhetorical question. I don't think they get question marks, do they? How was your day, Mildred? asked Mentor Man, who was dressed in a long jacket, and all of his clothes had an old military feel to them. Zombies and pirates, Mildred replied. And don't forget the sewers, Aisha interrupted. Yes, we ran through sewers. It was a first for me, Mildred stated. Sasha leaned in and whispered to Aisha. Who's he? I am the dream healer, the man answered to her meant-to-be private whisper. He's like a dream superhero goes by the name Delta, Aisha told Sasha, as Mildred and the dream healer walked off together and away from them. I've been here before with her, and they always go off and talk. It's kind of rude, really, Aisha said. Mildred and Delta stopped when they reached a good distance away from Aisha and Sasha, so no one else could hear their conversation. The area they stopped within was a group of very old ruins that seemed to be the remains of a million years of fast food restaurants, one built on top of the other. Someone in your school has possession of a powerful artifact called Singerstein. It once belonged to Loki, otherwise known as the Ring of Loki, Delta stated. We call him the King of Tumblr these days, Mildred said. Pop culture aside, the Norse Master of Mischief was a big fan of shiny things, still is, matter of fact, just doing it on other planets. When he left this planet with the other old gods, he scattered his possessions all over the earth, making sure mischief was sure to happen for centuries to come, when the stupid found one of them and was rash enough to try and use it. Jerk, Mildred said. Yep, and he hasn't changed from that personality trait either, Delta replied. So this ring? Mildred queried. Have you heard of it? Delta asked. I recall reading something vague once about a Singerstein. Didn't Loki fight someone in the sea for it? Yes, and he won that fight, Delta replied. Winner, winner and all that nonsense, Mildred said. Yes. You were much more glib in your dreams, do you know that, Delta said. Well, I'm not playing a part here, Mildred replied. You're more self-aware also, Delta stated. What's this ring do, Mildred asked, changing the subject back. It's a ring of change, and when worn by a leader, it will grant said leader the power to twist the shape of his charges, to mould them into superior regiment for battles, Delta replied. <sighs> and as usual, that's as specific as you'll get, Mildred said, with a bit of bite in her words. Mildred Betbeezer, you are one of the most unspecific beings in all of existence, so it takes a lot, even for me, to just keep you in focus. Welcome to Tin Pod Radio. The Trinity Prophecy by Marissa Kinzel with illustrations from Melissa McManus. Behind one of the trees at the opening, Nero spotted a figure. She was small, like him, and she had long hair that looked like green leaves woven together. Her skin blended with the bark of the tree she hid behind, and if not for her decorated dress and bright yellow eyes, Neros would not have noticed her. You're blue, she said. The prince smiled. I'm not blue, I'm Neros. 
The girl frowned, concealing herself further behind the tree. No, I mean your skin. It's blue. And, and you flew down from that mountaintop all of a sudden. Where does it lead? Neros looked fondly back up the mountain, though his town was shrouded by a white haze of falling snow. At the top of the mountain is my home, the tour. My father is the king, and today he said I'm old enough to explore Endra all on my own. He smiled, placing his hands on his hips. The girl didn't look so impressed. Endra is peaceful. Your king was smart to let you explore now, but you're dumb for leaving home. What? Why? Because you have no means of protection. The girl came out from behind the tree, gesturing to Neros with open palms. What on your person would protect you if I attacked you? As if to prove her point, the girl stretched out one arm, summoning long, limber vines from the tree's canopy. She sent them to wrap around Neros, constricting his body and pinning his arms to his sides as they slipped and circled his torso. The prince cried out in surprise as he was lifted off the ground and brought closer to the girl. See, you're defenseless, she proclaimed, grinning in defiance. How do you know that I won't kill you right here, right now? Remember